can only focus on one little area at a time. And this week, we want to stretch our thinking. We want to open up our hearts. We want to let God begin to refresh us and maybe expose some areas in our life that need God's wholeness. Uh, this morning, we had about uh, 15 people out that came running this morning. If you were one of those, anybody here? Yeah, yeah, we had a great time. Now, I want to give you a little challenge this morning. Uh, I think that there are many of us in this room that have, have been neglecting the care of our personal bodies, okay? Our personal lives. We don't need to, you know, uh, become bodybuilders. We don't need to do that. But we need to just honor and care for the, thing, the, the, the resource that God has given us. Tomorrow morning, okay, now that I got those runners all started, Okay, they can run without. I'm going to walk the course tomorrow. How many of you can come out and walk for 45 minutes with me tomorrow morning? All right? We're going to go for a walk, and it's, and it's going to be, maybe this might be the beginning for some of you of beginning to get your life in order in that way. Okay? All right? So, any walkers, any takers? A couple of you all? Man, we're, we're, and, and all the way, we're going to praise God, and we're going to, you know, we're going to pray. We're going to cause trouble for the kingdom of God, okay? All right? So what could God do if he would have a group of people that were truly committed to him and in the process of becoming healthy? What could God do if we would extend that into our families? Love our wives. Disciple our children. Not that they have to be perfect, but that we are going to lead them in a way that they can come to a faith of their own that will embrace the kind of Christianity, the kind of, of ministry that we represent here in CCDA. Can you trust God for that with me this morning? And can we open up our hearts to allow him to speak to us this, week, uh, this day? as we focus on shalom in our personal lives and in our families. Father, we love you, and we trust that you're going to do great things today. In Christ's name we pray. All right, go and uh, stand up to your feet. I know the vast majority of you were out running with Noel this morning. The rest of you guys were probably in the gym at 645. But for the few that weren't, we're going to just uh, sing a song. Right now it's going to get us going, get us active, get our workout in for the morning at least. Go ahead and put your hands together with me. The song, uh, when we actually sang it earlier, it says, If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, and you tell a mountain to move, it will move. You guys ready? Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza, eso lo dice Señor. Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza, Eso lo dice el Señor Tú le dirías a la montaña Muévete, muévete Tú le dirías a la montaña Muévete, muévete Esa montaña se moverá Eso lo dice el Señor Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza Eso lo dice el Señor Tú le dirías a la montaña Muévete, muévete Tú le dirías a la montaña Muévete, muévete Esa montaña se moverá Yeah. 
dirías a la montaña muévete we do when we come to God and worship is not only tell God what we believe to be true, but we remind the people around us. So we're going to sing some truths about God, that He is holy, that He is faithful, that He is righteous, that He is worthy. Some of these you can uh, just sing out from the bottom of, of your heart, and some of these you just might need to listen and be reminded by the person standing next to you that God is indeed all of these things. Let's sing this together. I call you holy. Your name is holy, you are so holy to me. As I call you holy, your name is holy, holy you are and holy. Your name is holy, you are so holy to me. Yes, I call you holy, your name is holy, holy you are. You are so righteous. I call you righteous, Lord. I call you righteous. Your name is righteous. Righteous you are, and righteous you'll be. Yeah, 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 yeah. I call you worthy. I call you worthy. Your name is worthy. You are so worthy to be. I call you worthy, Lord. I call you worthy. Yes, you are.
have been faithful. You have been worthy. You have been righteous. Show yourself to be awesome again. As one church, let us sing. Great and mighty is our God. You say, Great and mighty. Let's fill this sanctuary with praise. Great and mighty is our God. Great and mighty is our God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. CCDA. You can remain standing and let's just uh, praise God for our foster and for the way that they've helped us to usher in the spirit of Christ. You know, yesterday as we listened to the discussion about Shalom, I mean, wasn't that incredible? Wasn't that great to hear that we are the we are the vehicles for shalom in our city. I thought that was incredible and that all power in heaven and earth has been given to us. And so this morning, we have an opportunity to deepen that conversation. And you are very, very, very honored to have this morning one of our founding board members, um, Leah, Dr. Leah Fitzhugh, uh, Gaskin Fitzhugh, to talk about how do we seek shalom in our cities and before uh, and I'm going to ask her to come out now, but I want us to also lift up a prayer. But Dr. Fitzhugh uh, is the first woman president of Payne Theological Seminary in Wilberforce, Ohio. Another first. She is formerly professor of religion at Hampton University and president of the Gaskin Fitzhugh Group. She consults in leadership, and she will talk to you about that. She is the embodiment of that. She's a graduate of Rutgers University, and Leah received her MDiv degree from Princeton Theological Seminary and her doctorate from Harvard University. I am scared of her. Stop. <laughs> but we're going to pray right now for her. Let's just lift up a prayer for this time. Holy and righteous God, we just thank you, God, for the opportunity once more to come before your throne. We thank you, God, that every good and perfect gift flows from you. We thank you for the gift of Aaliyah. God, we thank you for the gift of this body. We thank you for uh, what you're pouring out through her to us, that we would be become the kingdom on the earth the way it already is in heaven. We praise you, God. We thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Let's give Dr. Skinner a hand as our 
Chairman of CCDA. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning to you. So I don't know that. Let's see there. Isn't that marvelous? I'm free. That's, that's fantastic. Certainly, I know you join with me in thanking Dr. John Perkins for establishing the foundation in those seven critical areas that we will be anchored to as we leave here this week. I certainly thank you for that, Dr. Perkins. And Ms. Vera Perkins, I am always happy when you're in the house. Does everybody know you're here? Stand up, stand up, stand up. I want her to stand up and just, that's right, just stand up and give her praise. This is, this is the woman behind the man. Let's give her a hand. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right. All right. All right. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's how we do that family thing, isn't it? Everybody has a role, and it's so important for us to acknowledge that. I also want to thank Wayne Gordon, who's been my dear friend and colleague and has supported me over the years for your significant leadership and for helping us to have this moment. I'm delighted also to have students from Payne Theological Seminary here this morning. I've been wanting to have uh, a class to share this experience since I started at Payne some five years ago. And that just shows you that things do move slowly in theological education. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are here. Would the Payne students please stand? I know they're in here somewhere. There they are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And to, also to the board members of this significant body, uh, persons who dare to believe we can do all things in Christ Jesus, who dare to believe. My challenge is to have a reflection with you this morning uh, as it relates to Shalom. And we talk about this whole knowledge of peace, and peace for the individual and peace for the family. And you had some real opportunity to hear Dr. Perkins uh, discuss the family as it relates to the centrality of, of what we're doing. I've chosen to look at this in a slightly different way because when you look at the word shalom, it basically says real peace means that nothing is missing and nothing is broken. Nothing is missing and nothing is broken. And we as human beings very seldom have an opportunity to experience a kind of peace where nothing is missing and nothing is broken. In fact, it's quite different from that. Today we find that many things are missing and many things are broken. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that because you see, unless you attend to the missing and the broken things, you can't have peace. You can have the illusion of peace, but unless you attend to that which is missing and that which is broken, you can't have peace. So what does that mean for us today? What is broken and missing that challenges the family today? I, you know, I think one of the things that's marvelous about this moment is that the way things are moving in the world, and we're all beginning to experience the whole possibility of less rather than more, we become closer together, if only to share the disappointment and the pain and the hurt that we feel, as well as the confusion. Does that make sense? So when we talk about what is missing and, and what is broken, it is just interesting to me that at this time, we would have the meltdown of Wall Street. What's broken? Well, it's not only that Wall Street is broken, it's 
all those systems that feed Wall Street. And so it looks like it's a major financial issue, but it's a moral catastrophe. And what happened is, as I looked at one writer talking about Main Street and Wall Street, he discussed what has to do with families because we struggle so hard to sacrifice and provide the phenomenal money that's needed for young people to go to school. And we're always excited when they go to the very best schools, aren't we? Some of us do strange things to get them in those best schools with the understanding that it's going to make a significant difference. But this particular writer reminded me that families do have a responsibility to not only be concerned about getting young people into these places, but to be mindful of what they look like when they come out. This writer stated that really it was the best schools, the Harvards, the Princetons, the Yales, Columbus, Stanford, out of which the very best and brightest had come and served as the feeder system for Wall Street. And he said that he took a look at one young man that had been to a school for uh, business and a law school. And this young man had gotten caught up in a fraud situation on Wall Street and left. And in describing what happened, he said, in the school that he went to, one of the best and the brightest, that they were taught to leave no stone unturned in finding loopholes. Loopholes, he said, as big as a truck in order to justify whatever it is they wanted to justify. Now, this may not be true of all those schools. I, don't, I happen to have gone to one of them. But it seems to me that his point is well taken, that how do we end up with theater systems from some of our best institutions that encourage these young entering minds and get to use their gifts and skills to find loopholes that will allow the law maybe to be acknowledged but not followed precisely. And it is the not precise following of the law that has led to the meltdown. And so something has to be said about how did those people, all thinking in that way, get to the same place at the same time to radically wreck not only the financial system in this country, but in the world. All of those people came out of families. And so when we talk about peace from the standpoint of nothing missing, nothing broken, Somewhere along the line, something was missing in what those persons were taught that would allow them to be so consumed with selfishness and greed and so distant from the possibility of the consequences of what that would do for their neighbors. I think it's a marvelous time for us to take a look at what it means to have everything and have nothing. What it means to be fretful and worried about where our children are going to go to school and get in these schools. And they get there and they come out and they're people we don't recognize. So as we look at the concept of the individual and the family, I want us to do so against the background of two 
What goals are we seeking as we seek to be individuals and as we seek to be families? And how realistic are those goals as it relates to what God wants us to do and to be? In the particular scripture that I want us to take a look at today, it has to do for me with what ultimately we are responsible for remembering, no matter our individual path or no matter the configuration of our family. And really for me, I think the way this meltdown has occurred and we now end up with 3.5 million homeless and three-fourths of a million persons without jobs just in 2008, three million foreclosures projected for this year alone, 47 million persons without health insurance. And when we look at just the sheer weight of student loans, 1.6 billion, some that will never ever be paid back given the financial situation we have. And we look at something like 5.65 billion for the Iraq war, or 11 trillion for the national debt, of which 45% is owned by foreign countries. It seems to me that up against this, we ought to be able to say that something is missing and something is broken. If it's not broken now, I don't know what it's going to take for us to understand that something is missing and something is indeed broken. And the scripture that I would love for us to just give attention to for a moment and for you to think about as we move through this process is that God really becomes God's best when things are missing and things are broken. And we take a look at this as we look at uh, 2 Corinthians 1 and we have the discussion going forth here in terms of some prior hardship. And what I'm interested in us understanding is that this concept of hardship and despair, while not exactly what may have been happening at that time, does operate at this time in this country and impacts individuals and families all across America. So we really are by way of this hardship, by way of the brokenness and the missing pieces, we are getting close to really being able to talk about the American family. Because it does appear that more of us are being grouped together by way of hardship than ever before. So here this statement is made in terms of reminding the brothers and sisters. It says that, in eight, we were under great pressure. If you see that after talking, so we want to remind you, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. And there are many people today who are under great pressure. Three million foreclosures, great pressure, so that we didn't really know how we were going to endure. And we despaired even of life itself. Indeed, our hearts, we felt, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But I love what happens next. But this was for a reason. And I want to suggest to you that the moments and the challenges and the trials and the hardships that we are going through in this country right now is for a reason. This was for a reason, according to this word here. The hardships were not for naught. It says, but this happened 
This feeling of feeling almost like we were just going to die. This happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Some of those people who are reflecting on their activity on Wall Street understand this morning that they were relying on the wrong gods. And that even wealth has a limitation in the face of God that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God delivered us from such a deadly peril and will deliver us. On God, we set our hope that God will continue to deliver us. Fundamentally, for each individual in here and for each family, that is all that God wants us to do. God wants us to be very, very certain that from the beginning until the end, that God will tolerate no other God. Some of us have slipped away from that, and what happens then is you see the meltdown of an empire. When little gods start to compete with God. And so God is saying, I won't have it. And I'll take my time about showing you what happens when you're out of order. And so I ask, God is saying, all I ask is that you set your hope on me. And I will deliver you. So what is needed then from those of us who are in ministry? First, it is clear that we're getting a brilliant example of what Walter Bergman calls the royal consciousness. And what is the royal consciousness? It is the kind of vision of the elite that is the perception and consciousness of which is thrust on others so that the elite may maintain their wealth and their power and that the masses may expect to be marginalized. In the face of that kind of consciousness, Marvin McMickle, who's uh, one of the authors that we took a look at this week in our course, Where Have All the Prophets Gone, is the name of his book, says that as prophets, first of all, you're not needed if everything is all right. If nothing is missing and nothing is broken, you're not needed. But if things are broken and missing, you are needed. And so Marvin McMickle says, it is the role of the prophet then to come and to challenge the political, the social, the economic, and religious forces that would combine to simply have the vision of the elite, those with great wealth, set forth as the only vision. Now, when we talk about what has to happen and the, when the prophet comes to bring us this word, you know then that things can't be the same. You understand that. And I hope you know that this moment in this history of this country means that this just can't be the same. Something different, a new consciousness has to emerge. And Walter Wink in Engaging Powers suggests to us that one of the challenges that we have as to what we should do is that we don't necessarily look at the correct definition of the problem. Too many of us, and for so long, have had an obsession 
with blaming the other. And the challenge with that, according to Wink, is that when something is missing and something is broken, on the magnitude of what we see today, that's not about flesh and blood, but about rulers, authorities, powers, and spiritual forces in evil places. So one of the things we're going to have to do as we learn how to be the American family with all of our differences, all of our experiences, is we're going to have to learn how to stop blaming the other as if that which is missing and that which is broken has been caused by the other. Now, we got a bit of work to do with that because, according to Wink, it says that the royal consciousness has nurtured this concept that uh, below us, see, they're, they're at the top, Below us, we'll let you work this out. And the way we'll do it is we'll have you participate in, in division. And this got started long ago. And it's such a challenge for us in this country because I don't know how much we really are prepared to bite the truth about understanding how we got to this point. But the economic collapse is no accident. We have always been challenged in the economic system in such a way that people end up wanting to blame others. And so because of this, Wink says we're really kind of socialized into patterns of injustice. We don't necessarily see it that way, but that we kind of live our lives into that. We kind of really participate in the complicity of our own alienation and our own bondage just because we are being told how to operate and maintain the system so that those above don't have to come and tack or be involved in those who are really at the bottom. Does that make sense? How did we get to this place? It's a strange phenomena here in this country that we spent real time developing the separation of people who are colored white and people who are not colored white. And it all had to do with economics. And at one time in this country, as the elite wanted to maintain its status and its privilege and its wealth, there was an intentional effort to have white workers, even some of those coming out of slavery. I'm going back to when there was a time when there was white slavery. But as that started to shift in this country, there was an intent to keep white people at a distance from the white slaves, at a distance from black slaves, but the moving away from calling them slaves, but to do so in a way that wouldn't make those new freed white persons think that they were entitled to the wealth and status of those people that were making the decisions. And so, they developed the concept called the pleasure of whiteness. And what that meant was, you will still have alienating work conditions, you will still be exploited, because we're gonna do whatever we have to do to maintain our power, our wealth, and our control. But here's what we promise you. You won't be black. We promise you that. And so for the pleasure of your whiteness, that will be incorporated into your wage. 
We won't pay you what we should pay you. We'll pay you less. You'll work in mines and mills under horrendous conditions. You won't have benefits. You won't have insurance. But, but just keep in mind now, you won't be black. And so the pleasure of whiteness developed as a part of the wage package of white workers in this country. And Du Bois says, in effect, it was a sad moment because by accepting the royal consciousness, exploitation, alienation, disregard, white workers failed to be able to join with other workers to form a kind of unity on behalf of all workers and the decency that they all deserved. It is an, you may not like that, but it is true. <laughs> and what you see from that is the coming together of class and race. And so today, we are seeing in this country now, still the ribbonness of that as the gap between the have and the have-nots is larger than we ever imagined it would be, particularly because in the 60s we saw the glimpse of the possibility of a kind of equality that we had not seen before. But then the economy of the 70s fell short again. And when the economy falls short in this country, the racial divide question always surfaces. So uh, those who don't want to talk about race in this country, then you don't want to talk about the economics of this country and the reality of how the two go together. But what has happened with the economic divide and the economic meltdown, more and more of us are going to have less to lift up as a part of our wealth and we're going to be more inclined, I do believe, to begin to think about value as that which is internal rather than external. Because as it looks now, we're not going to have enough of it externally to be that concerned about. Internally, we're still going to have the resources that we need. What does that mean for us then? Cornell West basically says that this country is suffering nihilism, a state of nihilism. That's what it means when things, some things are missing and some things are broken. And with, with the nihilism, it simply means that we're suffering a state of significant hopelessness, meaninglessness, and lovelessness. But this word comes to say, from that, we can be delivered. That wherever there is no hope, there's no future. Wherever there's no meaning, there's no struggle. And wherever there's no love, there's no now. The word comes to say to us, no matter how great the peril no matter how impossible the hour, no matter how difficult the moment, no matter how bleak it may look, there has never been and will ever be a peril that God does not have the capacity to deliver us from. And so families and individuals, as we struggle to work together, because that is the solution, not in isolation or separation, but the royal consciousness wants to keep us separated and divided. It has failed to maintain to keep its own self integrated and united. So it no longer serves as a model for us. And the alternative consciousness that we now enter into is to know that the love of God continues to be all that we need and that if we love God and we love each other, that in that we will be delivered. As I close, let me just say what Walter Wink has reminded us. That if we are going 
To be reborn, we must die. And we must die to that which has already caused us to be dead. And so as we look at the death of the moment that we're in, we have to die to the concept of privilege, but we also have to die to the concept of internalized oppression. All this very moment that we have, we've all contributed to it in one way or another, regardless of our color. We've all, according to Wink, been socialized into patterns of injustice, and we have contributed to this moment. But it is not a moment that will hold us if we, through this word, understand we are free of this bondage to the degree that we die to that which has been our bondage. And in so doing, trust that God will be our hope and will deliver us. I pray that as you move through this conference, that you will all die some while you're here. <laughs> and that in so dying, you will have that marvelous moment of being able to experience what happens when God is able to use us because we no longer belong to ourselves but to God. Thank you so much. Blessings and perfect day for you. Thank you. I invite you guys to stand to your feet. I think if we're all honest with ourselves, I know uh, in my own life I have a lot of little gods that oftentimes distract me from the big God, and oftentimes I need a, a reminder that we serve a big God, an almighty God, a God who uh, is above all the things of this world, all the uncertainties of uh, the financial markets in our world and all the other things that can go on in our personal lives and our families and homes. And uh, I need a reminder that I'm a, a, a loved by God. I'm a friend of God. That I serve, that we serve a God who is big, who is almighty, uh, who we can trust. Amen? Sing this with me. God Almighty. God Almighty, Lord. You are 
difficult times in our world, in our personal lives, in our families. God, we know that we can cry out to you. God, and you're the God who holds us close to your heart. God, that you can do incredible things. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. God, we trust you with our lives. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you to Foster. I like to call them Bananas Foster because they're so sweet. Well, this, this morning as we kind of close out our time, uh, we, we are such a wonderful thing to be together. And one of the things that's so significant, I think, is that we come to CCDA and we come as learners. We all are learners. And, and we come to be learners because we realize that that is really what uh, the association is and how we might do ministry better and how we might be more effective and how we might make a difference in the lives of our community. We have a sense of calling. And we have a sense of calling that, that God is actually doing something around us. Uh, well, a couple things before we, we talk about a, uh, just a few things on my heart this morning. And that is, uh, as learners, I think it's important for us to have resources. And so we have workshops and all the things that we do. And, and here at CCDA, we put together a little book package that we think every, every CCDA uh, person ought to have read a number of books. And there's, there's quite a few out there. But we put together four this year that's in a book package. It's about a $60 value. And, and we're... we're no one's making any money on it, it's just to make sure that you are reading some things. So there, uh, there's a book on uh, compassion and justice by one of our CCDA members. There's one on, uh, one on racial reconciliation and eight ways of how we can do that. There's one about a church that makes a difference. And then there's John's book called Beyond Charity that, that really gives the basics of what Christian community development is. And so you can get all four of those books for $30 at the CCDA table, uh, and it's, it's, it's a service to you. Um, also, uh, Ron Sider, John Perkins, and I got together about three years ago and started talking about, everybody's talking about partnership, but we're really not knowing how to do that. And so uh, John and Ron and I had a commitment to write something down and try to put something together, and uh, we kind of outlined of how we might do that, and so we decided to write a book together. And it's, it's interesting to write a book with other people. And then uh, we, we really needed somebody to really come and help pull this all together and help with some of the research. And becomes, we wanted somebody that was also a, uh, a CCDAer and understood that, and, and, and we, we got Al T's on. And so John and Ron and Al and I wrote a book together, and, and it took us two and a half years to do it. And I think that's maybe because we're slow and we're not, John, John was saying we, maybe we're not as clear as we used to be. But uh, we put together a book, and it's called Linking Arms and Linking Lives. And it's about partnerships. And uh, it just, just was published, it's just out, and the exciting thing about this is, is that you probably are not going to hear John Perkins pump this book very much because we got nothing for it. You know, I made jo nothing, John made, we made nothing, Ron, we didn't, we didn't get paid as authors, we get no royalties for it. A hundred percent of the royalties go to you. Half go to CCDA and the other half goes to Evangelicals for Social Action. So I don't know, is Ron here with it? I mean, is Al Tiza? I know Ron couldn't make it, but is Al in the room with us today? There's Al right there. He was one of our co-authors there, and, and he did the bulk of the work, and we thank you, Al, for your work. And uh, you can pick up a copy of this book uh, at, at uh, ESA table, at John's table, and at CCDA, uh, if it might be of help to you. Well, let's, let's, let's think a little bit about what God is doing in our lives. The first CCDA conference, the title of my talk was, It Ain't Easy, But It Can Happen. Now, my hat goes off to every one of you here. Because you have sensed a calling of God 
to go to places that most people won't go. As a matter of fact, many of you are in places that when you went there, your families thought you were crazy, your friends thought you were crazy, they thought you were wasting your life, they thought that you were giving away something that you really shouldn't give away, and you're doing it at a price and paying a price that's, that's sometimes heavier than almost we as human beings can do. It ain't easy to do Christian community development, but it can happen. Now, we've been working on this for over 20 years as an association. And in doing that, we have seen unbelievable changes and models and, and, and lives that have come to know Jesus Christ and communities that are starting to be transformed. We've seen that not only here, but in other parts of the world when the principles of Christian community development are applied. But we've also seen and I've walked with many of you, and I don't know all of your stories. I wish we had time today that every one of you could tell us your story. To hear your story, to hear your pain. To hear the story, you know, we, we, we lift up Mary Nelson as some great Christian community developer, of which she is. But we don't often talk about when she was beaten until she was almost dead one night and left to die. We talk and lift up Glenn K. Ryan as one of our great Christian community developers. And yet we don't talk about the struggle and the pain very often that it took to have that happen. Many of you, your homes have been broken into. John doesn't talk that much about those days in 1970 when he was in the Brandon jail and he was beaten. And his, his, his illness that took place now, 40 years, almost 40 years later, after being in the jail, and he was in the hospital, and I was speaking to him on the phone, and, and the agony that John was in, and I tried to talk to him every day, and the pain that he was in, he really thought he was going to die, were related injuries to when he was beaten in 1970. When I think of every time I called to talk to John in the hospital, his daughter Elizabeth was there and how she was feeling that pain. And so whether your name is Glenn K. Ryan or Mary Nelson or Elizabeth Perkins or Vera May or John or whatever your name might be, I know that you've gone through some heartache. I know that you've gone through some struggle. And whether you're black or white or Latino or Asian, somebody has said to you that you are crazy to do what you're doing. And it ain't easy to do what you're doing, but it can happen, and it's so fabulous to see all of that. We have kind of perfected now, through our workshops and through experiential learning, how to do Christian community development, and you are doing it. And you're doing it in phenomenal ways. But we also have to not be too quick to lament. We have to take time to feel the pain when it's there and not to ignore it. Because it ain't, it ain't easy to do what we're doing. Some of us are on the verge of burnout. Some of us are close to quitting. It might be economic. But I want to remind us of a couple things. I want to remind us of what this is all about. Matthew 22, 34 and following is when Jesus has asked this classic question, what is the greatest commandment in all of Scripture? Jesus answers that, which is really the foundational and the backbone of what Christian community development is all about. He says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But look at the text there. It says it very succinctly and very directively. It says now Jesus is asked what's the greatest commandment. He says the greatest commandment is to love God. But then he goes back and he says, and there is a second one just like the first. Now oftentimes we get this 
mixed up a little bit. Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God with everything we have, and he says there is a second commandment, and he says it's just like the first. He doesn't say, we often put God and then under here, what many of us in the church have done is put that underneath it, and that we love God and we forget to love our neighbor. Now in CCDA, we have the perspective right. We've understood this passage. We understand the great commandment. Jesus is asked what's the great commandment. He says love God with everything we have, but he says there's a second one. It's just like the first. It's not inferior to the first. It's not less important. It's just as important as the first, he says. And he says, and that is, it's just like the first. He raises it up to an equal plane that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That's how we reflect the kingdom of God. We used to sing the song, you will know we are Christians by our love, the way we love one another, the way we care for the hurting, for the least, for the lost, the way we care for the poor. And so we have that pretty well down. We understand that, and you are out there loving your neighbor. And then, of course, when we look in James chapter 1 and ask the question, you know, what really is pure and undefiled religion? What is religion that God wants? What does God really accept from us? But it, it, it's, it's that, we are, that we look after orphans and widows in their distress. That's people who can't make it on their own. Orphans and widows were often code words in the Old Testament for the poor. And then we keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To keep oneself unpolluted by the world is loving God and to take care of the widows and the orphans and the aliens and the poor is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. In the Old Testament, we see the classic passage in Micah chapter 6. We know that, verse 8. And what does the Lord God require of us? To act justly and to love mercy. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And so doing justice and loving mercy are the works of compassion, the works of mercy, the works of loving your neighbor that all of us are doing, and we're doing a fabulous job of it. When John and I go from one city to the next, we've had the privilege of being together in a hundred of your cities all over this country, and to see what God is doing. That's my favorite thing when I visit a city, is to see what you're doing. Not to, not to tell you how to do it, but to see how you're doing it. And it is remarkable, the creativity and the way you, you do it. And so I applaud you today for that. And the young people in the colleges and the seminaries that are starting to get it and are starting to want to do this, there is a wave that's happening, and we are getting it down. We have a formula. We have the eight key components of Christian community development, and it's working, and we're seeing transformation everywhere. But I have something heavy on my heart. I'm not looking today to inspire you. I'm not looking to have a great talk today. That's why I'm sitting down. I'm not here to woo you with my depth of understanding of how to do Christian community development. I'm here today because I have a concern and a burden on my heart that as we get so good at doing Christian community development, that we are careful not to lose our first love. I was with Peter Kuzmiak, who was behind the Iron Curtain at the church in Eastern Europe. And Peter made a statement, and he said, charisma without character is catastrophic. Now let's think about that for a moment. Charisma, which a lot of us have, we have a lot of charisma in this room. You can woo people with your, with your personalities, with your intellectual abilities. But without character, who we are inside is catastrophic, and we could give examples of that. Do we have a lot of charisma in CCDA where it's popular to be a part of this now? It's all exciting and everything is looking so great, but where is the character of us? Where is there our character? And I'm not saying it's not there, but I'm asking the question. 
Because when we have charisma and when we have all these great things going but we have begun to lack character, it becomes catastrophic. Big is not necessarily better. Please don't ever, please don't ever let somebody make you feel inferior because you've been in a community for 25 years and you have 22 people in your Bible study, in your church. You've never built a house. You don't have a medical clinic. But you have been steady as the incarnation of the body of Christ pitching your tent and living among a group of people. Big is not necessarily better. Growing in numbers is not necessarily better. Now, it's not necessarily bad either. So when growth comes, we don't necessarily need to say, well, you know, I better stop growing. I mean, how do you stop growing? But I think we have to be careful about that. And I think we have to be careful not to have people that we parade around who always have bigger, and so we get the idea that bigger is better. Because bigger is not necessarily better. But I want to go on to the last thought of this. And that is success without spiritual death is superficial. Success. Success in community development. Success in Christian community development. We can add the word C there. Without some spiritual death is extremely superficial. It's smoke and mirrors. If we have not helped people in their soul, and if our soul's not right, then our place of guiding people is going to be pretty weak. As a matter of fact, that we talked in, and A.R. Bernard last night mentioned pseudo-community. How is your spirituality today? How is your walk with Jesus Christ? How is my walk with the Lord? Is it superficial? Is it surface? Or is there a depth to it? I happen to pastor a church, which is my great privilege. My favorite thing in life is to pastor Lawndale Community Church. The people of Lawndale are so marvelous. My mom passed away this year. It was a hard time for me. I have a great mother. She was 87 years old. I was at Duke University with Noel and with Chris and Emmanuel there in the Center for Reconciliation and I got a phone call. My mom had fallen and broken her hip. My mom is a woman of God. She prayed for me every day of her life. She had Alzheimer's the last five years and it was a hard time. But my mom for three weeks, she broke her hip, she had surgery, she had a stroke, and she was on her deathbed. One day I was sitting in the car in Fort Dodge, Iowa, where my mom was in the hospital. And I came to the realization my mom was going to probably die. The doctors told me that, and the doctor used that word hospice with me. And when that word hospice gets used, you know, that's kind of a scary word. And it kind of scared me. And so I started, I went out to the car, and I just wept. I couldn't stop crying because my mom loved me so much. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my mom and dad. They cared for me. They loved me. They supported me. When people told them they were crazy to let a little boy, 16 years old, in the 1970, leave Iowa and go and live in the inner city of Chicago, everybody got mad at my mom and dad for letting me do it. But they stood firm and backed me. And my mom prayed for me every day. The last 10 years of her life, I called my mom every night to talk to her. And just to hear her say that she loved me. 
and that she was praying for me. So I'm sitting in the car and I am weeping uncontrollably. And I then said, thought, you know what, we're going to have to have a funeral for my mom. And nobody in my family lives in Fort Dodge, Iowa anymore. And I thought, if we have a funeral in Iowa, you know, it's, there's just probably going to be a handful of people there. And, you know, white funerals are different than black funerals. <laughs> and, and these days, I'm a black funeral kind of guy. <laughs> and, you know, these white funerals are, you know, you go there and you have a prayer and you maybe have a small quote-unquote eulogy. And, you know, it, you're out in 20 minutes. I mean, I haven't even gotten an introduction in in 20 minutes. And I, I had the privilege of preaching my father's funeral along with my brother. And I knew I wanted to do my mom's. So I'm sitting there and I thought, you know what? My mom, she, she, her church made quilts for every Hope House graduate in our church. For 10 years they made quilts and they said Hope House. And if you finish nine months, you got a quilt that said Hope House. My mom and dad helped paint my first apartment. When, it was, when we had to scrape everything off the wall, they came and spent two weeks to help Ann and I get our apartment ready. Everybody in our church knows my mom because she's there and been there so much to be a part of it. And I said, I, you know what I got to do? I got to have a, a place to, to mourn my mom with my family, which is Lawndale Community Church. So, you know, when you're the pastor, you can do what you want to do sometimes, all right? So I don't care. I'm not, I'm not the only thing. I have, a, I, I have a very strong, selfish motive. I decide I'm going to have a funeral service, a memorial service at Lawndale Community Church. And we have a Hope House ministry for men, you know, getting out of prison and getting off drugs. And there's 50 men in that. And I want, my mom loved them. And they, they got a choir and under the direction of Stanley. And so I thought, wow, you know, I'm going to have the Hope House choir sing. And then I'm going to speak. And I'm going to talk as long as I want to talk until I'm done talking, okay? Now, I don't know how long that's going to be, but I'm going to do it. And, and the Hope House men, see, they sleep at the church. They got to stay and listen to me. That's all I'm concerned about. And so, you know, I, we never made an announcement any place. We didn't make a big bulletin about it. I just simply, I said, you know, I told the church, you know what? I'm going to have a service at Lawndale for my mom. And, you know, it's going to be on an some evening well you know what I, I was just overwhelmed with love from our community over 500 people came to this little service for my mom and we were able to do it and people I think stayed for quite a while we had an open mic and people could come up and talk about my mom and I was I mean I, I was just bawling about how my mom had affected other people and then we let me talk, and I talked for over an hour about my mom. And I was healed through my lamenting and through my remembrance and through the community, the beloved community. I long for us to have that in our own communities. I long for you to have what I have at Lawndale after 33 years of being there. And the love and the support. But I've been thinking about this same stuff with our church. Is that I want to be sure that as a church, the content of our character is significant and that we have a depth to who we are and that it's just not on the surface. And so success without spiritual death is superficial. So one of the things we're doing at Lawndale right now is that I've challenged Lawndale to spend 30 minutes a day alone with God. Not a five-minute quiet time. Yesterday when I did the institute intensive that we have here at the conference, which is getting our training out. And the institute is such a wonderful thing, and I hope that your city will have it and we can come and be a part of that. But yesterday, one of the people in the class said, if you could do it again, how would you change what you did? What would be different about what life has been like for you? And I thought to myself, gosh, I don't know very much. And then I thought, oh, that's what I'm talking about tomorrow. You see, 
When I first came to Lawndale in 1975, I had this zeal, as young people have, to do the work of the kingdom. We are not guilty as James causes. People in CCDA, you're activists. We are certainly not guilty of being hearers of the word of God and not doers. But we are to be doers of the word of God. We are activists and we are doers, but sometimes I think we lack in our spiritual depth. And you know, for the first nine years I think I was in Lawndale as I was retracing my history, the first nine years I was there, I think I was called, but I think I allowed the drivenness of ministry to, to, to overshadow my call and to start working harder and working thinking that I could bring about this change. And then it was in 1984 that I read a book. It was a book by Gordon MacDonald called Ordering Your Private World. And when I read that book, I realized my private world was not in order. And it began helping me to get on a journey to deepen my walk with Jesus Christ. To have spiritual depth. My sisters and brothers, that's what's on my heart today. What's on my heart is that we got it figured out how to do Christian community development. But the moment we use our methods, our techniques, our technology, or even our principles to bring about change in our community without the spiritual depth of Jesus Christ in our own personal lives, it's not lasting. And it won't be there when you're gone. And it borders on superficial. I've asked the people of my church to spend 30 minutes alone with God every day. I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to double that. I'm going to ask you to spend minimal in the next year, 60 minutes a day alone with God. Mother Teresa, Henry Nouwen's book, it's called The Way of the Heart. Mother Teresa says this. She says, spend one hour a day in adoration of your Lord and never do anything you know is wrong and you will be all right. Kind of interesting. Pretty simple. Henry Nouwen says this. The solitude, when I go into solitude, time alone with God. I'm asking everybody at Lawndale to spend five minutes of silence when you begin your 30 minutes. And that's been really hard for people. How do you be quiet? No, don't read the Bible during that time. Just Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Henry Nouwen says, in solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding, he calls it. No friends to talk with, no telephone calls to make, no meetings to attend, no music to entertain, no books to distract, just me, naked, vulnerable, weak, sinful, deprived, broken nothing it is in this nothingness that i have to face my solitude a nothingness so dreadful that everything in me wants to run to my friends my work my distractions so that i can forget my nothingness and make myself believe that i am worth something as soon as i decide to stay in my solitude confusing ideas and disturbing images begin to appear The danger that CCDA might have is now that we've got Christian community development to eight key components and have successes in ministries all over this nation and all over the world. Our 
danger is putting Christ and on the margins of our paper and not at the center of that. I am not saying you're doing that today. This is a word of caution. It's a word from my heart. Is that the most important thing, the order of the great commandments, they're equal in their importance, but I think the order is also significant. That before I can truly love my neighbor, even though that's just like the first, even though that's just as important as the first, Jesus said is the second. It's the second thing we do. The first thing we do is that we are in love with God. We are in love with Jesus Christ. And I would say you, there is no way you could be in love with Christ if we are not spending quality amount of time. You cannot have quality time without a quantity of time. And so my challenge to you today is a very simple one. Let's not let anyone, any place, any time, anywhere take Jesus Christ out of Christian community development. And the only way, the absolute only way that we'll be able to do this is if you and I develop a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and that we spend Jesus Mark 135 says that Jesus got up early in the morning while it was still dark and spent time alone with his father sisters and brothers I ask of you today to make a commitment to not have a pseudo spirituality, but to spend minimally an hour alone with God. Be still. Know that God is God. The danger of Christian community development is not on who's elected president. The danger of Christian community development is not that we work hard enough. The danger of Christian community development is that will we have a depth in our faith in Jesus Christ that will help us to do the will of God. Lord Jesus, we come to you very humbly, very simply today, and we ask that you would help us to grow deeper in our walk with God. And Lord, I pray that right now people would make a commitment. In your heart, as you said here, Purpose in your heart right now that you're going to spend an hour alone with God. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come down. Just right now, if you're wanting to do that, just take a moment and make that vow to the Lord. I'm going to spend an hour alone with you every day, Lord. Lord Jesus... Have your way with us. Amen. Thank you, Coach. That was a great message. You can't go wrong with a message that compels you to love Jesus more deeply, can you? Well, we said that the early bird gets the best seats in the house. A lot of people are missing right here, but I'm going to try to throw these uh, hats and t-shirts out at you. And if you don't get the, get the free one, you can go and buy one for yourself downstairs near registration. These are the CCDA emblem ones that say shalom on them. We've got a women's version and a men's version. have got four of them right here. I'm going to throw them out. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> All right, I'll try to do better on this one. Hold on. This is my left hand, okay? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. All right, two hats. I hope I don't impale someone with these. All right. Okay, this one's going out far. All right. Oh my gosh. All right, well, you can also pick up foster CDs at the table back there. Are you enjoying worship? All right, you can take home some of that worship experience with you. So back there, you can get a CD. Uh, We've got new learning opportunities this year. So if you look in your booklets, you can see um, descriptions of some of the dialogues and symposia that we have. Uh, All the symposium sessions will be held here at the Knight Center. 
Also, check your booklet for different networking opportunities. Um, do we have any Texans in the house? All right, well, all y'all Texans, you are going to have a networking session today at 4.30 with uh, Gerald Davis in the Orchid Room. Also, uh, please make sure you check out the booths downstairs. If you take the stairs and to the right in, um, in Riverfront Hall, you can pick up some information on all the different ministries that are represented at the booths downstairs. And there is another invitation, a reminder, that if you want to be in the CCDA Mass Choir, which will perform in tomorrow night's session, uh, we're going to give Brooklyn Tabernacle a run for their money. So if you want to come and, and join in the Mass Choir, be at Jasmine at 6 o'clock tonight and again tomorrow night for a practice. And lastly, tonight we will be having a special emphasis on the youth in our session. And so there will be a youth band playing as you come in. So come maybe 10, 15 minutes early. We'll have some freebies again. So come and get these front seats and um, come support the youth tonight in their youth band session. All right. Have a good time. Go, please. Uh, go network. Go to the networking sessions at 1145. I I'll leave your proof when mountains move Now tell me who can be against me Your love is a sunny day The peace of passion's understanding Oh yes, your mercy swept me away Oh yes, the day I ask you in my heart I thank my God.